Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I think we may have a few people coming in over the next couple of minutes. I guess some folks are having coffee, but I, I think it's probably appropriate to get started. Uh, as you can read from the slide, uh, the, the topic is generally integrating streaming, video conferencing, and unified communication solutions. Uh, in the spirit of full disclosure, this is a panel that is heavy on the streaming side. Um, although, with the exception of having that in common, there's a lot of diversity represented on this panel. I think it would be a great panel discussion. And certainly, we will have UC solutions and video conferencing addressed uh, in, in depth as well. Uh, by way of introduction, I'll start. My name is Mike Newman. Uh, I'm currently a Vice President and General Manager at Polycom. I run their video content management division. Uh, the whole division was formerly Accordant Technologies, which they acquired. So, Again, going back to our respective pedigrees, mine is very heavy on streaming. I've learned quite a bit about video conferencing since the acquisition two years ago, but still uh, drive generally a, a streaming-focused, video content management-focused division. Uh, I'll pass it down to you, Doug. Uh, my name is Doug Thomas. Uh, unlike a lot of the panel, I'm more of an end user. Uh, I work at office.com uh, on the Help and How To side. Uh, so the articles you read, uh, how to do a pivot table, that's my section, and I do a lot of the training. Uh, for the last year, I've been doing a live uh, uh, webinar um, on uh, right out of the box with links. I'm a special, this or that, I seem to specialize in, uh, in making content and trying to distribute it. Okay. Uh, no cost, grassroots, inside a billion dollar organization, which is a little odd, but uh, so I don't have any of the marketing dollars behind it. So we do a 15-minute uh, help and how-to webinar. Anyone can sign in, no registration, and then we stay around and do Q&A afterwards. So it's, uh, again, it's not as structured, but we've been able to do it um, without scripts, without approval, without uh, going through a lot of the hoops that I think a lot of folks at Microsoft need to go through, and deliver um, a live content that we record and then put up on YouTube, and we do a lot duplication with live cameras and recorded cameras, uh, a mic for the live, a mic for the recording, stuff like that. So again, more of an end user of the technologies that uh, a lot of folks here on the panel uh, work on. Um, but uh, and then people, oh, before that, I did a lot of video at office.com, more personality driven, humor driven, help and how to, versus just the traditional screenshots. Thanks, Dr. Gary. Oh, good morning, I'm Gary Powell. I'm from the University of Toledo. I guess in my situation, I'm about 50-50. You started out with a heavy video conferencing, hardware codex, software codex, and a streaming solution. We marry the two together primarily for lecture capture, uh, viewing on demand of classes. Uh, we also use uh, conferencing solutions for uh, distance learning where we've had students out of the state and even internationally that attended uh, classes uh, via a video conference uh, with live cohorts in, uh, in the classroom. And we've done uh, special production for PDs around math and science education, and also a concept of uh, asked experts, where we've had uh, subject matter experts, researchers, PhDs working with classrooms and classroom teachers, where they may go through a scientific question or a bit of research in renewable energy or science and actually have a PhD that's working on an area of research actually dial into the classroom and they do a, a live Q&A, talk about their uh, research or actually a research question that the classroom students may be participating in. So, and also providing uh, on the streaming side, we have collected over 400 hours of uh, online, on-demand uh, video captures of lectures on um, dealing with uh, master level and above you know, course coursework. Yeah. Thank you, Gary. George. Good morning. So I'm George Lavar, and I'm the video services lead for Accenture. So what that means is that I run our webcast what I now call broadcast services area, and our telepresence and video conference operations and engineering. So I've got, and I've been in the streaming, I started in webcasting in the streaming world in about 1999, and have taken Accenture through the, through the whole life cycle from starting webcast as a robust thing to 
something that now involves our entire global video conference and telepresence infrastructure and integrate that as essentially several hundred studios that we use to produce live events both for Accenture employees and for distribution to the general public. Um, that's a growing area for us. Um, I can get into more detail later than Google. Thanks, Nathan. Yeah, I'm uh, <clears throat> Nathan Niederhausen. I'm a program manager at Microsoft. And main responsibilities on a content, an online content PM. And uh, what we found at Microsoft, I worked a lot with the internal technical field. So that would be, you know, Microsoft consultants, technical uh, sales folks. And my goal was to get them trained up to speed quickly. And uh, one of the things that I work on is an event called Tech Ready. It's a technical event held internally to Microsoft every six months. And what we do is capture all of that content and make it available to the technical field so that they can view that and download it and have that accessible. And then a the couple of things to tie into that, which I can speak to later, is also working on ways how to involve social media. And because it's an internal organization, um, we found and we've been doing a lot of experimenting with Yammer and how to tie that in and to embed that into our little video feeds and pages and different things like that. Um, also a little bit with Link, which is um, video conferencing. So that's thanks, Nathan. And so um, having had a chance to work with the panel in advance of this um, discussion, we all agreed that the format we wanted to set up was that this would be highly interactive. We're not up here for our own edification. Uh, if, if you have some questions, if you recognize you have some commonality with someone up here, please jump in, ask questions. Would love for this to be very well targeted to what your requirements are and, and I guess in that vein just by way of quick poll I just want to know uh, how many people are here representing organizations as content producers <coughs> right some alignment there uh, how about technology vendors okay uh, services providers okay well, that's great and, and as I said, I'm hopeful that you know we took a little bit more time during introductions just so you could understand where these folks were coming from. And, and our first question is really designed, our first topic, uh, to dig a little deeper beyond what they're doing professionally um, as individuals and, and target more what their organizations are doing to mix it up a little bit. Um, you know, George, do you want to lead off and just talk about um, what you're doing at or how Accenture is, is using your services? Sure. Uh, so, on uh, point of the topic here of, of the integration of pieces, so Accenture has a has a collaboration program as for several years. The main point of that was to drive adoption of video conference and telepresence technologies, so that Accenture's global workforce, especially at the executive management levels, could interact more closely without always getting on planes to meet in some other continent. So, so that was very much a travel avoidance cost-driven decision. Um, what, what we've done since then is to look at this as integration with webcast as a way to increase the value you get from your video conference and telepresence investment right, without having to do too much additional investment. Right? You, your video conference and telepresence is some cost that bandwidth you have in the network to make all that connect is already, is already there. So if you can integrate it well into your streaming, you then transform these video conference endpoints from a point-to-point -point device to a global broadcasting device. And, and so we have we've moved through that over the course of about the last three years. Um, we now have a broadcast center in Chicago. It is essentially a quality, quality broadcast facility built specific for taking video conference endpoints in and generating broadcasts, webcasts that have you know, graphics and lower thirds and roll ins and all the features you associate with you know, some type of news broadcast broadcast. Um, you know, we, uh, what, what we see is that, yes, people like the quick and dirty webcast, and just an executive gets his message out and that's fine. But in a company that has 150 some offices in 80 countries, I think, something like that. The 
only way you're going to get the senior executive presence to the employee base is through some type of online method. And so if you've got the CEO or a business unit lead, you might have a business unit of 100,000 people, they want to look good. And, and so, but they don't want to spend, they don't want to fly them around to do this, right? They want to go to their local telepresence room like they do every day for meetings, except now they talk to all the people in their organization. And so that's, that's the type of service we enable. Great. I think, um, you know, Doug, you used the word bootstrapping, which I haven't associated or something analogous to that bootstrapping, which is a term we use often with Microsoft. Maybe you could give a little more context. Of, uh, I'll try to figure out why I use the word bootstrapping. Uh, my thing is I'm just, uh, I use things out of the box. It's just, it's, uh, I'm doing nothing special. If we're using Microsoft Link to do, we go up to a conference room, we turn on a camera, there's no special lighting. It's that uh, you know, some of these guys have budgets and things like that, which sound really, really cool. Um, but again, if you have if you have uh, uh, the office suite and you have Link, it's what we're using. So people, uh, there's no anyone can uh, sign in. They get they they download an app the first time they've done it. Uh, it's a free app. We do free content, um, and uh, Link either has a limit of 250 people live or a thousand, depending upon what your setup is. And so. Again, what we're doing is with no special equipment, anyone could do it. Uh, what we're trying to deliver is what the content is and what makes it a really great webinar. So it's on camera. We do a lot of demos. We make sure that um, we're not doing seven minutes of introduction, that we're not going to talk about things and show static slides at the beginning. And what we have we do that is if you're in a live audience, we'll start it when we get on at nine, we start in fact. They'll be doing this in an hour without me uh, back in uh, Redmond. Uh, we got on at 9, we do some technical stuff. We'll start in at about 9.14, introduce the people in the room, do the camera work, talk about that, and then I pause, stop, and then start again with a different slide. And that's what you see on the video when we record. So there's a lot of duplication. Here. We have a camera that's an HD camera that will record, and that's what you see if you watch the recording, which far more people will that we will have a second introduction, and that's the introduction you see on film, so it starts right away. Because if you know you're going to listen to a webinar, you're kind of used to that tinny sound of, I am now talking in a webinar or a video conference. But if you stack it up to YouTube videos, it sounds absolutely horrible. One of the things we've done in office.com was we did a lot of studies and groups about video. And one of the things that became more important was not the video quality, that was important, it was the sound quality. And when you immediately start a video, even before you get to the introduction, if it sounds terrible, they're off. Everyone's been on YouTube, and you click right off. So it's important for us to have a good sound and a good visual to start. I learned this doing videos with quick introductions. I used to put a post it in front of my face, immediately say what I'm going through, and start talking. So to do that start, to, to know that you're doing a video content and a live content and work on both of those things uh, is, um, is vitally important to us. And so we do 15 minutes of, of, of talking. We may edit it a little bit if there's a breakdown and all that, which is great because the live audience knows about it, but the recorded audience can't do it. And uh, we have a video person who just kind of does that on their own stuff, not using anything extensively. And usually we could have the video out probably the next day. But again, everyone in the room is a content editor. Most of their main job is writing. They're not bringing in a lot of specialized people. So if you find talent that can do that kind of stuff, uh, that's the important thing is the content versus uh, we're not worrying about camera and lighting. I hope that answered your question. It did. <laughs> I think we'll jump to the same organization, maybe different business unit. Uh, Nathan, sure. are you in a lighting situation? Uh, yeah, so again, the uh, primary audience or maybe an audience that I serve is the internal technical field at Microsoft, and we have about 18,000 employees. And primarily what, I've, what we've found is um, and some of the trends that I believe are happening is that it's capturing the content. You know, you have Khan Academy that's getting really big, you've got TED Talks and different things like that. And I think that sometimes makes traditional learners and trainers a little nervous because it's not as structured. Um, with our tech Ready conference that we have every six months, only 5,000 of our target audience can attend. And we offer 800 sessions over five days. And 45 se um, sessions are running simultaneously in 21 time slots. 
So if you're an attendee to that event, you can only attend 21 sessions. But there's 800 sessions available. And so we capture all of those, all of that session content, actually stream some of, of those sessions live, and uh, get it available, made available quickly. Um, I manage a, a site called TechCreditTV.com. It's, it's an internal Microsoft site. And uh, we found that getting the content out there quickly and available to the audience is what they want. And again, we're, we're recording the SMEs. We're not going through a lot of structure of getting trainers and different things like that. We have like a camera or recording it um, is kind of not the main focus. So for them to be comfortable to present to an audience, we want them to pre present to the audience. The camera or the capture is kind of looking in to seeing what's happening. I'm finding that that's kind of the <clears throat> trend for us is just to get that content and archive it and have it available. And then the next step, something that we're working on is incorporating some social media. And again, uh, you know, I've got Facebook and Twitter and different things like that, but there is a tool um, for enterprise situations called Yammer. And that's where you can take a corporation and kind of replicate that social media kind of collaboration. And uh, doing some kind of cool things is, as, a, as far as embedding a little Yammer feed next to the video page that's displayed. And uh, watching some of the interaction go on between speakers and attendees during the event and after the event, actually. So a lot of cool things that we're working on and uh, make our content available like on a phone app, a Windows 8 app, on the website, um, enable them to download it um, so that they can just have that content when they need it, when they need it. So. Gary, uh, I mean, we go way back and I kind of watched the evolution of the University of Toledo. Um, were these initiatives for you driven predominantly with an installation of video conferencing and you built off of that foundation or, or how did you get to where you are today? Well, that's a good question. Basically, we started with back then. We started with a full deployment of uh, hardware codecs. And we were distributing out to partner schools. So basically, our area, basically, we're outside the institution. We were basically deploying a video codec out to uh, partner schools in the area. And from that point, we sort of got the idea, it would be great if we could capture some of it. Or we actually ran our first class where we had a cohort local to Toledo, then we had, you know, students in, uh, on the East Coast and out in Utah, and they were actually doing class in real time, and were in three different time zones, and it was like, it would be great if we could capture this, because it was just there at the moment, live, it was done, and, and nothing after that, so that's sort of where we came up with the point, because we were grant funded, so every year we had a new move of technology, I had money to spend, so we found your product, Solve the uh, a need we had. It would be great to capture this, skin it. We had the video window and we had the content window. So it was anything we get on the desktop, we could capture. So and that was nice. And from that point, it, it sort of built from there. And then we decided, well, we put some codecs into some classrooms. And, uh, we were redoing the whole building, so we had smart classrooms being installed. We put a hardware Kodak mounted in the back of the room. Basically, it became the, the third student watching the classroom when we basically recorded in the first round of this lecture captures from that point. So, very often I need to go into more depth and wait for questions. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, please raise your hand. But, uh, <laughs> but go ahead. What is the thought? Uh, which? <laughs> okay. Well, drop brand, brand names. The codecs we were using were Polycom, and then we got the court and capture system, which now is all Polycom. <laughs> so, I'll go ahead. Yeah, so my question is for the gentleman from that Accenture there. Uh, when you're talking about video conferencing and webcasting, are you talking about simultaneous events, or are you talking about using endpoints as webcast studios, if you will? Yes, in both cases, depending on which event we're talking about. So then the reason I ask is because you know, we view uh, video conferencing as low latency, bi-directional communication, right? Webcasting, one way, lots of latency. So how do you reconcile those two if you're trying to do both at the same time? So the, the question is how do we reconcile the 
low latency, real time video conference with the higher latency broadcast nature of a webcast, right? Um, the answer is it depends on the, well, the different segments of the audience get different experiences. And so, so for an example, um, when we do our quarterly CEO broadcasts, we will have our CEO is based out of Paris, so he's usually sitting in Paris. And you know, other members of the executive team that might be presenters might be sitting in New York where our CFO is, London, you know, maybe someplace over in India if they want to bring in some leadership from there. Then there will also be usually around 10 or so other telepresence rooms where there will be audience members. So those rooms will be watching. They will also be, you know, we'll plan to go to them for some Q&A. But then there also is the larger broadcast audience. And which is they, like the town hall audience. Right, which is the town hall audience. They've got the ask a question button on the interface. And so they can submit questions. And then there'll be a moderator sitting somewhere in one of the telepresence rooms, usually next to our CEO in that room, who will feed questions in from there. Because they can't do real time. Right. So I'm just curious how big your uh, telepresence <coughs> network is to support this? Um, telepresence were in the range of 100 endpoints and other video conference endpoints, a couple hundred. You're that's globally, right? Yes, that's global. Sorry, do you have a question? I have a question. I guess related to Neil's question here was, uh, I guess, interactivity. Do you need to how do you deal with that? I guess that more for New York with you, but I know with the class environment, if I have a question, I want to be able to ask that question there, not wait, how do you deal with interactivity or confusion? Well, it depends. We had two options. It was very similar to the centers, where depending on how the remote student's coming in, because we've actually set them up with software correct, so they're actually in real time, and some of the classrooms are master level and above. They've actually been sort of running the class remotely, so Reviews. So, you know, half the semester, you know, each class session, you know, one of the students were actually in the class. So we enrolled in a second monitor, you know, 42 inch LCD, and we did this little Hollywood Squares approach where there's more people were on that screen. And we brought in a second codec, and they were pointed towards the actual audience. So they were interacting that way. Or we brought them in, or they were doing group work. We brought them in on a laptop. And they set the laptop literally with the group, and they were going to group that way. So, depending on if, so that way they were right there in the moment. And if they were sort of the audience watching the, sh the live stream, then we use we have a skin that has a cute a live Q and A that they can actually post questions, or that they were actually before we got that running, they were actually just doing it in instant messenger. The instructor had their laptop, and they had a I am chat session going so they can pose questions that way and the latency between uh, you know the actual people on the call versus uh, the online stream was actually about well, was 25 to 30 minutes, which I find amazing considering what it's all doing so we have something like that that we've done before in terms of uh, webcasting live conferences uh, across the country and what we found is uh, I'm just trying to get a clue so what you guys do in terms of interaction. But what we do is we just the same as you would do is we fill questions via instant messages, text messages, we give that call in for the live broadcast. But we had to produce it in a way that those calls in questions were kind of answered at the end. Uh, because of the latency, we were already had to move on to another subject by the time that question even got through. So we kind of set up sessions for questions and answers at the end. So I was thinking if there's a, a better way to do that via either instant messaging or can I add, I think you see a lot of the same problems in corporate communication. We're doing an earnings release, you have people coming in via conference call, you're trying to deliver JPEGs or slides, you're trying to support some form of chat. Some of it's just trial and error. I mean, I can remember way back in the day, you say, okay, wow, we, these things are coming in, there's 12 second difference. So if you go on a conference call, we're going to disassociate the slides from the streaming content, deliver that separately, the delay is almost nothing. You know, so it's in real time, but I, I don't think you want to do your first shot, you know, live. I think, I think the coolest thing that you could do is you can also do a call in. So someone can call in for the session, and one of the question and answer sessions, and you say, we have a call in to our studio, 
in the back question live that way. Uh, of course, it was delayed to the end user, uh, but you were doing presenters that were live BTC. Yep. And then we were doing that, we were coming back into our end user via webcasting. So uh, I think that was pretty cool the interaction that we had, and I was trying to see if it was a good time to do it. Great question. I think you know you age more rapidly when you face those situations. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for the job, gentlemen. So, how are you getting the stream on your DC endpoint into the system? And what we use it for a farm meeting the interaction with the stream and then the other end there? And then, how do you get the stream into your stream on your endpoint side? Do you mind repeating the question? Sure. So, so the question is how do we get the streams out of the endpoints and what's our interaction plan? So, we use, we're streaming in Flash, H.264 Flash and HLS. So essentially what we do is, I kind of think of it as there's, there's three domains. There's the video conference domain, there's the broadcast domain, and there's the webcast domain. So we've got video conference codex and telepresence codex, and we scale all that to HDSDI, put it into broadcast, create switching, production, produce a show, and then put it to encoders, which make it into a webcast. So and how do you get a, how do you get an SDI out of these two pieces? Um did you, did you need an endpoint or you need yes, a CS or a it, um, you need it, a CS or a, um actually how did you get it out? Actually, you join the conference as a as yeah. endpoint. And we use actually we've got two racks of things with C40 codecs and then we have outside FS2 scalers. And we scale it into HD SDI format. So you join your Join your studio yep. every call. Right. Take SDI yeah. out. You know, right. From there. So yeah. What's your, so what's your client interactivity for them to be doing Q and A and texting and everything else? Well, that's on. So that's in the web. So as far as the interactivity and texting <coughs> side, that's on the webcast application side. Which is what? Um, what are you using? We're using Media Platform. Okay. And yeah, so we manage the Q and A from there. Um, you know, we also have done some. We also do some live call in. Pieces. Um, we will do Q and A at the end of an event, typically, to deal with that. Um, we're also looking at adding in a video call-in. We haven't done it yet. We need to get our need to get our control room automation right to make this work. But to take in either from Jabber or from Link, so and to take video call. This in. is a an interesting area of questioning. Generally, I think we should revisit it. I wanted to jump ahead to the next question, just at least hit on. Um, maybe in a more succinct way, uh, if you could put your finger on just the one or two benefits, uh, the value proposition for, for why you're driving these initiatives and what's the benefit to your organization, I think um, that would be useful as well. And if we want to circle back to these questions, we can. Sure. Uh, why don't we just go down the line? I think that's... Well, again, being an end user, I'm, I'm, uh, there's no large corporation saying, mm, let's try to do some webinars. I'm in the help and how-to business. We try to get content. We decided to go with uh, uh, a little bit different format uh, than the typical three-minute or 90-second screen capture. So um, that was the benefit of that is uh, to have a, a piece of content at the end. And again, we do Q&A at the end because unless you're indexing and you're trying to stack up against other videos, who cares what your Q&A is because that's usually it's not the questions you want to ask. So it's just usually the content that we have for help and how to, putting pictures in PowerPoint, how to do a pivot table. Um, and so to have a little bit longer area for help and how to office is the main benefit of that. And again, just some other thing to put out there that's a little different. And we're going to restructure some training, what we learned in this kind of off the cuff webinar. Uh, and then the other thing we do is the content, because you can't put a 15 minute video out there and socialize it, is we do a 30 second trailer. So that's what we put out to the social channels to give you a little taste of what, if you want to spend the time, this is what uh, you'll talk about. So um, again, I'm so far down low on the totem pole, I don't have a, an overall organization, because I'm sure the president of office doesn't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Maybe should. after today he will. <laughs> <laughs> and Gary, uh, you've made some big investments. You know, how are you justifying those from a, a benefit statement perspective? Well, primarily as far as being a educational aid, because uh, we're using it basically as a course capture uh, PD presentation system, along well as 
being an aid as far as promoting a distance learning component, but primarily we're creating a library of coursework that lives on, depending on on the on the degree program or what classes we're doing. Some of them only last for a semester, then they're archived to DVD, and then they're taken off the system. But we have a a couple of specialized master's programs that we've actually have four years worth of coursework that we've actually saved so those teachers can actually go back and look at content from uh, there's a speciality dealing with uh, renewable energy and science education. So it's kind of high level climate change studies, uh, biofuel chemistry. So not just your typical uh, courseware that you know a junior high or high school science teacher would run into. So it's also a way of basically it's our version of a Khan Academy, but at a higher level. So instead of being segmented out in five or ten minute segments, you know it may be an hour, half, two hour course presentation. So you have uh, the instructor with the video window, and we also have the content of any slides, presentations, documentation. Anything that was done in the classroom is there and it's syncable, searchable, so you can fast forward, rewind, so it's an on-demand presentation of the coursework. So, And part of their charge is actually do professional development in, their, in the schools in which they teach. So they want to go back and refresh the content, you know, pull off some statistical information or just relive the funds of uh, biochemistry for <laughs> biofuels. <laughs> That, you know, that's there, and so that's primarily been the greatest asset is being be able to provide that on-demand stream of all the content. Um, I'm sorry if you covered this already. Um, what do you use for your content management? Um, once the recording's done, the um, uh, content's all captured. Right. What happens to it from there? Well, we're using the Accordion product, so we have a, basically a dedicated video, uh, simple portal that has all the all the content videos there and it's searchable by date and instructor and what a, a few of the metadata tags that we associated with it. But we also use SharePoint as sort of a, an infrastructure so that's handling at LDAP as far as accessibility. Then there are associated links and other content that is housed inside of the SharePoint that points to the individual video feeds or the, of that coursework. So. We don't have a full-blown content management system. It was a, we're looking at convincing the institution to do this, as the institution is actually doing uh, a lot more of this. That uh, the need is starting to arise. That we need a better way of cataloging, searching, and making this more accessible. As this content is starting to live on, versus you know at the end of the semester it's wiped clean, like out of uh, our course management system for uh, online classes. You know. It, it lives for a semester and it's gone, where this video content is living on for years. And now that it's more of a, basically I'm the content management system as it stands now, but we're looking for something a bit more automated and well, gonna, systematic uh, after I that. I was going to so. say there are associated concerns in addition yeah. to organizing. It could be protecting, it could right. be tracking, it could be automatic ingest, scheduling. Right. So there's a lot of different ways of looking yeah. at it. Just really quick, I saw a question over here. Well, we have with the slides, you, you have a, the shortcut link that gives you all the slides and you can click on a particular PowerPoint slide and then advance the video to that point in time. So if you kind of know what you're looking for, at this point we kind of put in the odious on the, on, the, on the student that you don't have to take, you know, stenographer quality notes if you just want to kind of get an idea at this point in time this happened. So it's more like a cliff notes versus the full blown notes you took when you were in college or when I was in college. Because the whole point is that you should be able to interact with the instructor and actually ingest what's saying versus trying to copy down everything because we're, yeah. we're sort of doing that for you. But at this point in time, I haven't really found a real elegant way of doing it other than going back after the presentation and putting markers and descriptive points but we do have an automated chaptering system that we have set for like in 10 minute segments. In theory, we, there are a lot of sources for metadata. Right. So speech to text, right. yeah. yeah, speech it, to text, theoretically. Right. Um, I, I would say 
using that for search as opposed to closed captioning might be a smarter route to go just based on accuracy levels. Uh, there's automatic metadata generated from slide notes, from slide text if you have optical character recognition. Uh, there's manual input, there's uh, speaker date, speaker title. Those things should all be able to be cataloged and ingested and I would guess hopefully there are some vendors in there that can talk to that. Um, JD? How are you guys handling mobility? So tablets and phones, today's viewers, future as potential collaborators? Does someone want to jump up? I can address that. <laughs> <clears throat> um, so as I mentioned, um, once our content's recorded, we have it published within 24 hours. So because we're Microsoft, we have a Windows Phone app and a Windows 8 app and also a Windows RT app, so that would go to the tablet. And uh, with all of those apps and the site that we have, um, our users can access that content pretty much on any device that they have. And uh, found that that's been very helpful. Just a quick experience, there was a, a gentleman, a technical um, sales specialist that had to go meet with the CIO and wasn't up to speed on the products that he needed to, and this was within a couple of hours. So he just pulled up his laptop, went to the app, watched a session, kind of went through it, viewed the slides, which are available also for download, and he had the information that he needed to go speak to that person. So again, it wasn't restricted to, you know, razzing into an intranet system. We have it on a secure internet site. So, you know, he could view, you know, access the stuff from a Starbucks if he needed to. So that's kind of the goal that we had. And uh, just wanted to touch a little bit on the benefit piece. As, and this is more for the content producers. And my feeling is that we need to think a little bit differently about how we kind of offer up this stuff. Because think about your employees or your users that are coming up now. They're young kids, very familiar with social media, Twitter, Facebook, texting. Um, lots of videos, and so that's kind of the way that they're growing up and learning with. And so a couple of things that we're doing with going back to the interaction question really quick is we use Yammer, again, which is a social enterprise social media tool. We have the opportunity for the attendees or, or the audience to kind of go in and ask that question real time using kind of a session hashtag or the video hashtag. And we're not dependent upon the presenter to answer that question because there will be multiple people watching and it's more community kind of driven. So others will offer their input as well. But the subject matter expert may be a PM in Office or Windows, but his associates or his fellow PMs will be on the, on the stream too. So they'll just type in and answer the question as we go. And then they'll also, you know, team up and save it for the end. But, you know, more and more of what we're looking at is more of that community focus. You build that community with a lot of subject matter experts and have them jump in and answer the questions, have them jump in and kind of be a little bit more interactive, which has helped out a lot. Great. And George, I think um, you haven't had a chance to talk to the benefits question. Um, well, I, I guess I, I sort of alluded to it, right, that the, right, the benefit is that we don't, we don't look at webcasting from or streaming from the standpoint of you know, cost avoidance directly. Right? The, the general view on it is that it is a way to increase employee engagement. It's a way to get the business unit leads, to get the message out to employees in the only way possible. Right? The, what's, what's your other choice? Emails? Right? You know, people aren't going to read those. So, you know, it's, it, you have hard enough time getting people to watch a video that's longer than five minutes. So, um, you know, it has to be a good one. So, I mean, I, I know our CIO looks at it very much like, you know, he knows how much it costs per head per year to deliver email to the enterprise. And so he looks at what is the cost per head for delivery of streaming content for global delivery of video content to the enterprise. Now, th that's kind of how his view of the matter is. And so the delivery of it is looked at really as a global service that people expect to be there. And, and that, by the way, brings a whole different set of challenges in terms of network and technology infrastructure and all that when people expect that video will work. 
wherever they are. And yes, on tablets, from the internet, through CDNs, all that as well. So off script a little bit, I have a question. Um, are any of the panelists measuring the success of their initiatives in any quantifiable way? as far as number of attendees per year, average duration of viewership. Nathan, I saw you. Yeah. And I'll get to, I saw there were some questions down here. We can. So with our it. program, we do measure, because we're tied in and, and the user has to authenticate, so we know who views the session. And um, we also offer <clears throat> up a little online eval associated with it too. So you'd go to the session page or the video page and you'd have an embedded video player and then kind of the little uh, social interaction through Yammer, but also a link out to an eval, which is just a very quick eval, just to kind of measure kind of their satisfaction of what they, they viewed. And again, it's primarily um, focused on the content, not necessarily the, the, the delivery mechanism. So we can pump that back in and it goes into our business reports and things like that. So um, we know the number of users, unique users, the sessions they view, different things like that. Okay. Do you have a ratings? We do. Yeah. Uh, oh, hold on. <laughs> How about we start in the back and we'll work our way forward? Uh, you mentioned captioning. I was thinking about it at the same time. Do you use automated captioning software or have you any for that at all? We don't for our stuff specifically yet. That's something that we're looking into. The cost is still a little bit out there for the amount of content that we're producing. Again, 800 sessions over five days, and that would be relatively expensive. And Accenture probably has multiple languages to worry about. I, actually, we don't. We, we, don't deal with, we don't deal with captioning um, or multiple language. Um, now, Accenture's official business language is English, and the vast majority of offices and people do speak English. Now, there's certainly, we certainly do do events that are, you know, either region or country specific where you know, it'll be an event in German or Japanese or something like that, which is a challenge for my producers in the US and Prague. But uh, you know, so we do have foreign language events. We did actually get one request from an event in Tokyo last month where they wanted to know if we could do simultaneous translation and multiple audio tracks. Um, we, we didn't do that, but we have at least had one request for that type of thing. There was a question. Uh -huh. Why don't, yeah, why don't we bifurcate that question? Doug, was there a part of that question or the entire question you wanted uh, to answer? I'll just say that I, we have linked conference rooms at Microsoft. I've never used them. We're just in a regular conference room. We put a regular little HD camera up on a tripod so it's not the looking at my chin. You know, from the, I mean, that's the one thing that you want to get an external mic so it's not the little tiny mic on your laptop. You want to get an external HD camera, just a little small one, put it on a small tripod so it's a different angle than the chin because it's not really that exciting. Um, and then, so I, you know, I think to do that is a great thing, but I don't think it's needed. I mean, again, people can go on link and they get the IM session, they get the video, and the main thing that I'm working on is the screen capture for the demos. And I monitor that on a, on a, on a monitor so I know at least somewhat of the latency of that of, as I'm doing the demo, but it seems to be pretty good. So, um, Again, I'm in the help and how to do business, so it's not a president's message I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get that message out. So if they're getting, if they're watching the video and listening to what I'm doing, if they're watching the demo, or they're on the IM session, again, I have, I'm not doing anything on IM for the 15 minutes I'm presenting. I have folks in the room or people that are online. And, and as Nathan said, if you get the customer answering the question, it's like on Facebook, if you do anything with social and they're asking questions and other customers are answering that, that's better than anything you could talk about. And then you can verify saying, hey, yeah, Mike from Dubuque is doing it correctly. So I think there might be, uh, and maybe these guys have companies that will fund those things and will be glad to build them for you. But the whole nature of YouTube and the whole nature of just turning on camera and talking 
can be done, you know, we'd like to have a better room. You know, the, the, the mauve walls look pretty ugly. But if, um, I don't see that, again, that you can, you can do the stuff with special equipment with the budget that Nathan has and 800 events, and that's great. But as long as you get someone that hopefully is engaging and that's content that people want, is that you should be able, I did a whole series called Office Casual where I put the camera up in my office and just filmed there. I mean, that's all I did, no special lighting. I had one little fluorescent, I mean, a non-fluorescent light I turned on. So I don't think that necessarily you have to do the link meeting room. Again, but I'm building content for extent for, for, for uh, it's not internal, it's all for external. So um, I don't, s I'd love to work in those rooms because they're really cool, but I don't think it's needed. But that's just my end of it. Yeah. yeah. So, so I just want to add to that. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, I think her, her question is valid in that, um, you know, over time, the fixed video room, standards-based video conference room is going to go away. And it's likely going to be replaced by the new Microsoft Link meeting room technology. You know, there's four vendors out there now that are showing this technology, and it's, it's got a lot of uh, advantages to the current fixed room video conferencing mm -hmm. environment. Collaboration, touch screen, uh, integrate, tight integration with Link and so mm -hmm. forth. So I think, you know, your question then is, if you go to a Link meeting room integration, how can you leverage that type of implementation for webcasts? And I, I can mm -hmm. answer that with some things that we do. So we do have on occasion some remote speakers that are presenting through Link. And we look at Link as kind of um, one, two, a few. So you, to be a truly interactive in Link, you know, you can't have more than 20 people. That's even too many. And so we, how we tie that into the streaming part is that one of our, I guess, clients of the Link would be the stream, whereas we are screen capturing or capturing what's going on in the link session and then webcasting at that out to the many. So the link is, you know, preferred more for the, the smaller groups for the interaction, but then the many can leverage, I guess, the presentation of link through streaming. So that's kind of how we do it. It's, it's uh, got a little system where we pull the, um, do a screen capture or screen cast of, of the link session. Pull the yeah, I was, I was going to jump in really quickly. Um, you know, I think implicit and the question is just looking at those investments that have already been made and just seeing as a vendor what's going on and coming from the streaming world. I think currently the video conferencing locations are being underutilized and it's in large part because people say, well, I don't want to do a real time meeting. Well, it's also a heck of a high definition, high quality video camera that could be leveraged for a lot of asynchronous communications as well. So you know, I think as a starting point, you take a step back, you say, how are we using the investments we already made? And then, I mean, even as, we kind of got it to going to 11, you know, running. Okay, interactivity, how do we deal with latency? I mean, those are all very complicated. At a bare minimum, very simple question might be, are we producing any real-time communications that we may want to archive? Then you get into transcoding, then you get into streaming. Another question, and this is more where I think the audience was focused, was scalability. Okay. Large live event, how do I achieve 5,000 people simultaneously? Well, there's a lot of companies with a pedigree in focusing on only that. So how do you use that on an infrastructure that was designed predominantly for video conferencing? I think those are the kinds of questions that organizations should be asking, in large part because they've already spent a hell of a lot of money. So it's like, well, do I need to choose path B even though I went down path A? No, you can merge them. It's going to take some work. And I think that's something this panel can help address as well. It's not just what happens at the extremes down one path, but what happens when someone told me I don't have much more budget and I need to dual purpose this environment. Yeah. Um, so, so I have a question uh, directly at you. Uh, you're with Polycom, right? Yep. So um, I have yet to see an endpoint, a standards-based endpoint, that has kind of turnkey out of the box streaming built into there might be something out there. I haven't come across it. No, I so are any vendors kind of looking to incorporate, you know, uh, built-in streaming to a standards-based well, endpoint? Yeah, we do it. Oh, go ahead. Well, it didn't exist. I sort of built one, so I've, well, well I mean, it's I a problem. No, it's a great well, question. Here's how, here's how we do it. If people are building it in. 
Yeah, this was a company that was traditionally video conferencing and via the acquisition of Accordant made a commitment to streaming. It currently uses a product that transcodes and essentially converts traditional video conferencing content into streaming content. On the back end. Yes, is that the optimal solution? Is that the roadmap vision? No, um, but for traditional video content vendors, that kind of seems to be the interim path. So to your question, um, not within the traditional video conferencing world, uh, although the space is so crowded and complicated and you know, there's so many vendors, I don't know how many will be here per se, because it's more of a streaming show, but um, you know, extent, that's like we partner with- The room is trying to achieve, right? Yeah. But it's, it's funny. <clears throat> But our, for instance, and I know there are other vendors that probably provide this type of solution, but we were the integrated component into Link that enabled you to archive those Link presentations and ingest them into a central management system. So it really is a, uh, an ecosystem of, of partnered vendors that, that will enable you to do that ultimately, I believe. I don't think it's a single source. Um, if, actually, let me just make one comment to, to her question on this, that um, yeah, our, our video room is going to go away. Well, um, I know that our leadership is considering what to do when our you know, three screen telepresence rooms are fully depreciated. Do you replace them? If so, with what? But I think my, my thought on it is that video conference rooms are a great known quantity, right? So it depends on what you want your event to be. I, I think we also need to be careful to separate interactive sessions from oh. broadcast sessions. And so, you know, I find that I and my team, we really have to talk with the communications and marketing people inside the company and ask, what are you trying to get out of your event? Is this an interactive session? Is this an information sharing session? You know, what are your communication goals? And then you can decide, should this be link? Should this be video conference? Should this be webcast? Should you fly everybody to a hotel, right? So there are different cases for each. But if it's an event where you're gonna have 5,000 people watching or a bunch of external people and Accenture's brand is at stake. You have to know it's going to work. You have to know it's going to look good, sound good. And so, yes, it's very convenient for your presenter to pop up their laptop and sit at home or at a hotel. But you know nothing about their network. You know nothing about their audio, their video. You know, their PC could have a problem that day. You lose control. And so if it's a session where it's got to work, then I want them in a telepresence room. I want them in a video conference room where I know the lighting is good, the audio has been engineered, everything is set. So when they sit down and talk, it's there. It's kind of back to the uh, metrics on return of investments. What you're saying is you need the right equipment to be able to effectively stream in a, in a good way. That's a lot of money in, if you're doing a video conference room. I mean, what type of actual <coughs> metrics are you using to show that yeah, people are watching these things. Mm -hmm. We're not just spending our money on making these glamorous things. Then the second question uh, is, how do you convince your network team that video conference bandwidth and stream bandwidth is important, mm -hmm. you know, like, if you want better quality? Yeah, so metrics, so yeah, we, we track how many people watch, how long they watch, what offices they're from. Right, so, so we do track. What tools or what, um, what recording do you just use your portal recording? Yeah, yeah, we use portal. Yeah, we just use the reporting that comes from logins to the logins to the event, and we can get time of you know time of watching from that. Um, in terms of network, well, again, th this comes from a very high level, you know, CEO level commitment to video collaboration to bring the full you know, to bring the far flung enterprise together on video, and then streaming comes along under that. So, so yeah, we have. You know, we spent a lot of time engineering QoS and traffic paths and bandwidth and, and all that for telepresence and video conference. And it's a, it's a continuing effort to keep all that right. Because, yeah, a network that's good enough for email is nowhere near good enough for video. Question? Yeah, my question's, uh, I think, for George. But we spent a lot of time talking about the capture and different options. Um, how much are you investing inside of your content distribution network, assuming you're doing it all internally? based on how many people are joining a live event, what type of scale are you able to offer? Um, so, so the question is on scale and CDNs and yes. d delivery. So internally, we run mostly multicast. And we also offer our events to, we, we send it out through 
major external CDNs because a lot of Accenture's people don't work in offices. And so it is authenticated, secured, and delivered, you know, both for PCs as well as iPads and okay. mobile devices what through external. Like 5,000, 100,000 customers are employees at one time. And what's that experience as far as we see a lot of things around how long it takes a person to join a live event? Is there any feedback? Um, I mean, our, our largest events are 15,000 live. And you know, generally, it, it goes very well. You know, we've, we've, we have load balanced clusters of, of web servers to, to redirect through to the front end. We have multicast. Um, we're also looking at doing some other stream splitting internally for areas of the company that can't get multicast you know, because of firewalls and various network security restrictions. So really quickly, we're at about the end of the hour. Dan's uh, allowed us to stay at over a little bit, but if people want to catch a, another panel, please feel free uh, to excuse yourself. Also, I've put the names of all the panels up there if you want to write them down. I'm sure they'll be at the show today. Um, and I'll just keep taking questions as long as you have them. How about? I just wanted to know, in general sense, how big are your teams that help you do what you do? I mean, That's a good question. <laughs> 30. Um, so my, my team is about 40. Now, now, I will say though, right, that's not just streaming, right? So this is, this is webcast, this is production, event planning, delivery, engineering, application operations, as well as then telepresence and video conference globally for engineering operations. And so so it's, it's, a, it's a large area. How many system admins support that, that business? Which piece? Um, <laughs> telepresence. Casting, telepresence, telepresence, video conference. Ten. Okay. Ten, twelve. And then I have another ten event producers that deal with content. The guy in the orange has had a question for a little bit. So. Sorry. Go ahead. What's regarding the use of video conferencing and streaming as well? Any experience in multiple presenters from different locations to then streaming that forward to the broader audience? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, and even some using dedicated rooms or hardware codecs, and we've had people coming in via using software codecs. So we, you know, we're not elaborate as with a control room and all but, that infrastructure. But we use the, basically use the switching of the mm -hmm. we put in presenter mode and let the the codec do the switching. We've run it as simple as using a multi-point uh, conference where we, if we know we're going to have four people. Or if we need something larger, we've actually used the institutions, one of the institutions' video bridges. So we let we do it that way. Mm -hmm. And the endpoint just calls in and is ingesting, but it's, you know, it's being handed off. So, you know, I'm kind of envious that you have a and team and control <laughs> yeah, and yeah, but, but, uh, but I'll, I'll say we, you know, we, we do, many of our events are very similar to that yeah. with presenters around and we let the bridge do video switching for yeah. us. And I would say if it's, if it's a link session, we've experienced this. So if you have you know, roughly 15 people having a link session and they all have their cameras on, so link has the ability to switch to whoever's talking and then that video pops up and that's who's displayed. So that's just something that's built into the product. Uh, this is for George. How do you plan on using Jabber for video calling? Um, I heard you mention it. Or yeah, do you we can. Have a plan yet, or <laughs> we're 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 working on that plan. Yeah, because we have a national implementation of Jabber, and I'm yeah, trying to so figure out at this point how to implement that to our webcast. We should we know. should talk afterwards yeah. then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is there anyone else I missed for like the last half an hour? That <laughs> probably okay. Yeah. Why not him? Yeah. So uh, tell me uh, just a, a brief insight into some of the conversations you have with your IT department about what you. Increasing the return on investment from the video conferencing infrastructure by increasing essentially the endpoints to which the content is delivered. What are some of the metrics that you use in those conversations with IT? Um, to be honest, they haven't asked for a whole lot of detailed <laughs> yeah. metrics. I mean, you know, for what they what they want. Well, I guess it, very quickly, kind of the the life cycle of, of webcasting, right? Back in the Early 2000s, everybody wanted live events and they had big budgets and they were going to bring a camera crew out and everything, and so you did that. Then budgets dried up and people didn't do that anymore, but they kind of wished they could. So now you've got video conference units everywhere and you can tell them, you know, remember how we used to do events with people everywhere? Well, now we can, 
because you've already built your video conference units. So if you give us money to integrate that into streaming, we can give you what you used to have. It just, you don't have to bring in a camera crew every time. And everybody goes, ah, okay. Sounds good. So really quick before this devolves uh, into chaos, I just wanted to, <laughs> to thank the panelists. I think they did a fantastic job. They brought the diversity. Yeah.